we are starting our, the last panel of our conference, uh, which is called Hegemonic Crisis, Imperialism and Global Security. Uh, I will briefly introduce our speakers and I would like to remind you that each speaker will have 15 minutes for his and her talk. And this will be followed by uh, a Q&A session, which you can join by sending your questions to the chat. And I will read them. Uh, I will read them aloud so that our speakers can answer them. Uh, I would also like to remind our panelists uh, uh, that it's advisable to speak slowly because we have uh, an interpret uh, interpreters working here. And yeah, that will make everyone's uh, experience a bit, a bit better. So here today we have Taras Bilos, who is uh, a co-editor of Commons, our journal, uh, and who has also been active in the debates among the left on numerous platforms. Uh, you can read his articles in Jacobin, in uh, various other international uh, publications, and his, uh, his interventions uh, concern the position that the international left takes on, on this war and the questions of global security. Uh, and international coordination. Our second speaker is Gilbert Ashkar, a professor of development studies and international relations from SOAS, University of London. And he will be talking about, he'll, his, he will, his talk is titled For a Socialist Anti-Imperialist Conception of global security. Uh, the third panelist is Zofia Malish from Razem, Poland, uh, who is also an active member of the, of the debate on the left uh, about the Russian aggression in Ukraine. Her talk is called Why the World Needs a Left Security Policy a look from the Eastern European perspective. And last but not least, we have Ilya Matveyev, a political scientist, uh, a member, uh, a, a, a researcher from Public Sociology Lab and a contributor and editor of Posle Media, uh, Russian anti-war platform, which also publishes in English and also an active member of debate uh, on Russian imperialism. Uh, his talk is titled The Limits of Deglobalization, How Far Can the Formation of Political Economic Blocks Go? I tell you, uh, I remind you about the titles of these interventions because uh, not all of the, uh, they, they are not, uh, un they are not unfortunately in our program. So please uh, uh, be attuned to, to these topics and prepare your questions. And now uh, we will start with uh, Taras Bilos. Uh, he asked, uh, he asked to speak first because he has, complications with his internet connection. Okay, no, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, no, it turns out that uh, Taras can't, uh, can't, can't, can't join us out now, unfortunately. I hope he will uh, join us uh, at the end of this hour. 
before the Q&A. So uh, therefore, I would invite uh, Gilbert uh, to speak first. I give the floor to you. Thank you. Okay, Volodya. <clears throat> uh, thank you for, uh, for the invitation. And I'm very glad to, to be part of uh, this uh, panel and uh, actually to, of this uh, general, the activities organized by Commons, which is a remarkable <clears throat> uh, uh, publication of, of great quality, judging from the English, of course, I, I can't read uh, uh, Ukrainian. Uh, um, and uh, uh, well, it, it's a nice opportunity to meet or meet again uh, some uh, other fellow panelists here. Um, well, I thought that I would be speaking at the end because uh, that's how it was presented and my my topic was therefore something looking at the future. But uh, since now I'm asked to speak at the beginning, uh, it's important therefore to address the uh, the immediate title of uh, of this uh, of this panel. So um, first of all, about uh, the, the the left uh, position towards uh, that. I mean, this has been discussed a lot, and I'm sure uh, within this conference too, over the two three days of this conference. Uh, and I apologize in advance, but of course I haven't attended the, the previous panels, and I couldn't attend anyhow. But especially not all of them. So uh, there's a lot that uh, may have been said about these issues. Um, anyway, uh, I think that uh, the, the 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 principles for an anti-imperialist uh, stance in uh, uh, world affairs and in issues like wars uh, is, is pretty clear. Uh, uh, we, we draw a distinction uh, between legitimate wars, which are wars of, uh, of uh, national defense or of national liberation, right? And uh, uh, imperialist wars or colonialist wars or whatever, which are wars of oppression. That's a very basic distinction. Uh, that includes even the distinction between the nationalism of the oppressed and the nationalism of the oppressor, which is also a basic distinction, even though internationalists may be or are or should be, uh, uh, I, I mean, beyond any form of nationalism, including uh, uh, nationalism of the oppressed. But nevertheless, we draw a major distinction between nationalism of the oppressed, which is legitimate, as long as it remains uh, within the framework of fighting oppression against oppression for liberation, and nationalism of the oppressors, uh, which by definition is, uh, is oppressive and therefore something that should be fought against. And uh, therefore that's how we, we look at every war. And uh, uh, I mean, in this case, uh, the, the debate that has existed, which shouldn't have existed because I, I think the, the, the situation is so obvious that there shouldn't have been any debate because you have uh, an, a, an, an op historical oppressor of Ukraine, Russia, uh, the Russian Federation, but Russia in particular, its core, invading Ukraine uh, with a very clear colonialist uh, discourse. The discourse uh, embodied the speeches of Vladimir Putin. Um, and, and therefore, uh, you have one country that is aggressed, that's Ukraine, that is fighting uh, a war of self-defense, which is a legitimate war by any standard uh, we take. And there is an aggressor country, an imperialist country, which is uh, Russia, uh, in the role of the, of the aggressor. Uh, if 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 there was any any discussion um, among people belonging to the left uh, internationally, and here I'm not counting those who believe that uh, uh, Putin is their model, huh? 
uh, anyone believing that Putin is uh, is some is the kind of uh, or, or a regime that that uh, should be supported uh, does not belong to the left. I mean, that's uh, like having had uh, with all the distinction possible, but uh, with all the differences. But I mean, uh, there are kinds of oppressors in history where if, if you support them, you can't be anything called left. Uh, um, so if you put aside this, the only discussion was about those who had such um, uh, a fixation uh, with Western imperialism and US imperialism in particular, that they tended to, to portray the, the, the Russian move as uh, almost as a defensive reaction against Western intrusion or Western encirclement uh, of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of Russia. Um, some gave the, the kind of argument, you know, about um, NATO expanding to the borders of Russia, um, explaining so how, how would the United States react if uh, Mexico, uh, uh, you know, uh, became a basis uh, for uh, Russia or China or, or whatever with the deployment of Chinese weapons. Uh, well, that's an interesting argument because if you take it to the end, well, let's suppose this happened and the United States invaded Mexico. What would they say? Would they say, well, the United States is reacting and the fault is Russia's? Or they would say whatever Russia has done or China in putting weapons in Mexico, the aggression of the United States on Mexico is an imperialist aggression that should be repelled. And the same applies to uh, uh, to to uh, to Ukraine uh, and uh, the ongoing war. So I think the matter should be uh, very clear uh, in that regard. And uh, 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 any uh, hesitation in, in in that is actually, uh, uh, in some way, uh, belittling the significance of the invasion, of the Russian invasion of Ukraine, which is a major crime. Of course, there have been others, the United States did terrible things, uh, Iraq, Afghanistan, um, uh, and the list can be very long if we, if we go to the, the, the whole Cold War period. But this does not mean that, uh, uh, or is no excuse or pretext to uh, uh, just uh, take a different stance from what Russia is doing uh, in turn. And Russia also has done a lot, whether in Afghanistan or Chechnya or Syria. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Putin's Russia in particular has been an extremely aggressive country, which has been involved in very destructive wars as the Syrian tragedy. Now, beyond that, the, the issue that uh, I wanted to address, and I will address in a very um, uh, uh, concentrated form, is uh, what, I mean, what can be a, a socialist uh, policy towards international relations? And uh, I spoke of the attitudes towards war, uh, uh, of course, anti-imperialism cannot be divided. So uh, the, the real anti-imperialism is a rejection of all imperialist countries. And here we have a tradition, even the Russian revolutionaries uh, during the First World War were quite clear with the, 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 this uh, small section of the left, which stuck to an internationalist position in rejecting all imperialist countries. Uh, there is, uh, uh, and therefore uh, having a, a real anti-imperialist stance, which is against all imperialist countries, whichever uh, uh, they are. But uh, beyond th this issue of imperialism and war, uh, how can we imagine uh, uh, the, the, I mean, a socialist policy towards international relations? <clears throat> Here we have, again, to distinguish between two things, utopia, I mean, of course, we can develop a utopia about what uh, what kind of world we 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 dream of. You know, a, a socialist world where uh, uh, maybe you would have uh, a completely 
qualitatively different United Nations, uh, much more powerful as the, the, the central organization of international relations uh, with different rules. Uh, of course, no veto rights, no, uh, uh, no such things, uh, maybe a second assembly. And uh, besides the assembly of states, you could imagine an assembly elected by populations. Uh, uh, on the basis of representation of populations. So may, somewhat like you had in the uh, in the Soviet Union uh, kind of constitution. I mean, uh, uh, an assembly of states or of nations and one of populations. So you can imagine something like that at the global level. Um, uh, like, uh, I mean, that was also the, the imagination of the the the, uh, the revolutionaries uh, after the, the Russian Revolution of 17, because even the name itself of the USSR was not a national name. So it was conceived as something that would extend to the whole world uh, as a, uh, a union of uh, socialist uh, Soviet uh, republics. Uh, the term Soviet was not national term, as you know, of course, you know more. <laughs> even better than I, but it means uh, uh, councils. It, it refers to, to a form of, uh, of organization of politics. Now, this is utopia. And what we need is to define what we can defend under the present conditions. And that's the, the, the key point. And here, I would say that uh, uh, the United Nations is an important historical uh, achievement which is a product of, of centuries, if you want, of history and, and terrible wars. And uh, it took two world wars, very destructive, especially the second one, to lead to this kind of organization, which is definitely a major step forward in international relations, whatever limitations it has. It has limitations, it has flows, but this is, uh, uh, in the present world, that defines the framework of international law. And I think socialists should defend the United Nations, the, the role of the United Nations, the UN Charter, uh, and as a basis for international relations. That includes, uh, that includes the, the also uh, non-interference of states as, as, as states in the affairs of, of other states, <clears throat> because this is an important <clears throat> principle in the sense that if you remove this principle, as is the case in the present world, what you have are powerful states intervening in the affairs of weak states or weaker states. You don't have any equality. That's, for, that's why this pr principle of non-interference is actually more equal more democratic. That's at the level of states, but that would also require that states uh, do not also practice the double standards, which are very uh, common, especially on the part of the United States and Western states. One should say uh, they uh, pretend to be following standards of democracy, freedom, and the rest, but they apply them in a completely uh, uh, uneven manner, uh, they really practice not only double standard, but multiple standards in their relation with the rest of the world. And that's interpreted by the peoples of the world as hypocrisy, and rightly so. So this should be uh, uh, rejected. And a, a distinction drawn between states and popular movement. We are on the side of popular movement. We have on the side of political parties and all that. As political parties, as social movements, of course, we interfere in the affairs of the whole world. We are, we, we are, uh, we should be built as internationalists and fight for freedom, equality against oppression everywhere. But as popular movements, as social movements, uh, uh, and that's not uh, the business of, uh, of, uh, of, of the states. And I will add and conclude by uh, the great importance of uh, uh, fighting for disarmament. That was inscribed even in the UN Charter. Uh, um, there has been <clears throat> uh, periodic attempts at putting disarmament on the table, but I think there should be an international campaign for disarmament. 
uh, for uh, like uh, the the if you check online you will find the the appeal for disarmament by 50 nobel prize uh, 50 holders of the nobel prize in uh, in sciences they uh, launch an appeal suggesting that the whole countries of the world and that that would be something organized by the united nations the reduce by 2% every year their their military expenditure and that they calculated that over a few years this would make of course a huge amount of money that can at least part of which can be used in the fight against climate change and against pandemics which are major threats facing humanity today so i think this issue of disarmament which uh, the we can find a first expression of in the workers movement in friedrich engels who wrote in the late 19th century, uh, uh, a pamphlet calling the workers' movement to uh, fight for disarmament uh, with a vision that is uh, similar somewhat to what I, I, I mentioned. I think this should again be a major component of the international policy of, uh, of socialist movements. Uh, thank you, Gilbert. Thank you for delineating uh, the possible lines of action for the internationalist, the internationalist left and uh, pointing to the fault lines that exist in the debate uh, around this war, although, as you said, shouldn't exist. Uh, in fact, I. Uh, decided to place your contribution first because as i guess from the title it speaks very well to the debates in the previous uh panels round tables that we had one of one of the points of contention that emerged in the round table with the representatives of ukrainian progressive volunteers was was as follows uh, a german left wing activist called maximilian uh, urged ukrainians ukrainian soldiers actually he didn't urge he demanded that ukrainian soldiers should fraternize with the russian soldiers on the on the front lines and uh yeah that was that was kind of contested as something utopian and unrealistic by 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 the discussions on, on the ukrainian side and keeping in, in in mind this this uh weird questions that might arise i think that what you pointed out the distinction between strategic and utopian kind of vision and tactical uh, medium term and medium scale uh, medium scale steps that the left would take in for example so supporting uh, existing international institutions is extremely important there's something that uh, somehow lacks in, in in the debate on, on the left and what what comes instead is, is a sort of clash between uh, Western, uh, a, a lot of a lot of the left that is uh, that is situated in, in in the core Western countries of the global capitalism and the so-called East, um, which reflects the global division of labor, but also reflects the global division of left uh, of progressive knowledge production uh, and for some reason the left in the core countries somehow tend to think that they monopolize the universalist utopian long-term perspective while the left in the east tries hard to think about strategic uh, tactical and medium-term perspective uh, 
Uh, but I think this is crucial and this is important because uh, this brings us back to uh, to the roots of of, of Marxism, uh, to to the type of thinking that Engels himself was exemplifying while dedicating a lot of his time to analyzing the minutia of battles of of uh, uh, tactical moves of, of the German imperialism and, and Russian imperialism. And uh, therefore, in focusing on these, uh, these divisions and dimensions, I want to invite Zofia uh, to talk about the perspective from the Eastern Europe. Hi, uh, my name is Zofia Malisz. I am from the Polish left party Razem, and I would really like to thank uh, Spilne uh, Commons for the invitation uh, and to be able to take part in this very important panel with um, uh, inspiring panelists um, and to finally be in the same, if, uh, if only, a remote space uh, with uh, Taras Bilus, hopefully in a few minutes, because we haven't met yet, but I really admire uh, uh, his work, uh, both intellectual and on the ground, and in general, uh, the editorial board of Spilne, uh, you are doing a great job. And um, yeah, just wanted to thank you at the, at the beginning. Uh, okay, so uh, I wanted to talk about the vacuum uh, of security policy that has been created, uh, that exists on the left, and why these uh, vacuums, this, 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 this vacuum that has been created is uh, very dangerous uh, and does a lot of damage. Um, I think what uh, uh, Gilbert said at the beginning about um, uh, the pacifist utop utopia uh, is part of the initial uh, frame uh, that I uh, also uh, thought of um, introducing uh, at the beginning. Uh, so um, yeah, so let let me start perhaps with um, with the kind of a vacuum of vision uh, on on uh, foreign and by extension security policy that we have on the left, particularly uh, radical left right now. And why uh, filling this vacuum uh, is so very important, given that we um, live in times of the return of history, uh, and particularly for our region, uh, and by their region or our region, I mean uh, Central Eastern uh, Europe, um, why uh, coming uh, at least temporarily in the short and the midterm away from uh, you know, or at least in parallel engaging in um, constructing short-term, mid-term visions that are not utopic and not militaristic um, is so very important for our um, security. So uh, what is the big picture uh, regarding left foreign and security policy, policy? So what are the security conceptual frameworks that we are working with? So. Um, the ones that are proposed most often on the global left uh, are unfortunately very abstract uh, or extremely ideologized um, uh, visions. This means that uh, they are not very useful in cases when the sword falls and there is an armed conflict that had not been stopped by diplomatic solutions. And when the power uses armed conflict as part of its uh, internal policy, such as the Russian Federation does, or in case of imperialistic and genocidal aggressions with which we also have to do in uh, Ukraine um, uh, by Russia. So the extremely abstract solution that I mean, uh, that is uh, only uh, useful to a limited extent, um, particularly in the extent that Gilbert was talking about as a kind of a global wider vision. vision. Uh, however, you know, in, in, in its forms that we have uh, encountered in, in our existing uh, uh, dialogue and conversations with the Western left, uh, what we usually uh, are encountered with, with in terms of a vision for, for security is the, the, from my point of view, uh, naive pacifism, as in uh, we want peace, uh, we do not want war, and we'd rather have not weapons around. Uh, <clears throat> 
And the other paradigm that we uh, uh, we see very often is the, uh, from my point of view, uh, too ideolo ideologized uh, paradigm of uh, no NATO as a block and full stop, right? Uh, just to be clear, uh, as Gilbert says, as long-term solutions, uh, peace, demilitarization, uh, and no military blocs uh, such as NATO and CSTO are definitely goals worth pursuing in the long term for, uh, for the left. But um, these are not answers for today. Uh, so um, I think what, what, what are more powerful arguments for today is uh, are provided in the form of uh, continuing to, to oppose the fossil industry and the military complex connected to it. And I will be talking about uh, a kind of a program uh, that uh, of, of, of for, for a defense, uh, for a security vision that Razem proposes that comes from the left and has these components uh, definitely as kind of a, um, uh, a very important components of this vision. But uh, for the here and now, in the short and midterm, uh, and this is the view from Eastern Europe, as long as the Russian imperialist uh, threat exists, uh, countries in Europe, such as Finland, Latvia, Poland, Romania, have the right to arm themselves and, or to demand from NATO to move arms onto their territory. And I think to demand an immediate dismantling of the alliance is, first of all, not realistic. It's ideologized and it effectively overlooks uh, the security interests of uh, Baltic and um, regional states. Uh, that is all NATO states bordering Russia and, uh, and um, by extension, of course, uh, Ukraine. And this is the, the minimal uh, political consensus post-invasion um, on which Eastern and Western European left um, perhaps not must agree, but uh, at least start debating uh, without prejudice uh, in order to, to uh, come together and, and fill some kind of a dialogue vacuum that is also existing. Such a dialogue on a larger scale is missing um, and it kind of prevents building solidarity. Um, so regarding replenishing arms in our region uh, as a national policy in NATO countries such as Poland, Slovakia, the Baltic states, Romania and so on after they had, for example, supplied the Ukraine with their own stocks uh, is not a sign of supporting NATO imperialism or its uh, um, aggressive engagement of China that is a possible uh, future outcome of um, imperialistic ambitions of the US. Um, so replenishing arms, unfortunately, is necessary in, in, uh, in those countries in a phase when uh, Putin and his surrogates uh, directly threaten invasions and the nuclear annihilation to Warsaw or Vilnius. Um, so, um, and, you know, Razem has, always, has advocated and campaigned uh, um, strongly to arm Ukraine, uh, and it would also um, not be advisable to uh, to do, you know, to to prevent, um, to basically deny the same to to the neighbors from the former buffer zone, um, because this buffer zone uh, still apparently remains in the interest of Russian oligarchic elites that wage the current war. If you believe at least what you hear in uh, Russian media and so on. Uh, but more importantly, what I wanted to say is that if you say no NATO and uh, and so on, it's wrong in the sense that uh, you cannot make such a generalizing, uh, opposing the bloc in its entirety um, is is kind of conflating local political realities. So the truth is that you cannot really state anything about the political situation of NATO member states um, that would apply to all of NATO as a bloc. Uh, so we have been for a long time uh, trying to uh, reason uh, on the grounds of you have to consider what the political situation uh, of particular member st states is uh, and um, propose 
alternatives to NATO and not just say uh, simply no and you should uh, leave the alliance or um, you know uh, demilitarize completely. So this uh, debate or non-debate because we we uh, Trazem and on the you know the left in, in Eastern Europe has not really gotten uh, a comprehensive or uh, even remotely comprehensive response from uh, let's say the Western left to this question. If not NATO, then what? Um, um, this unanswered question, uh, this question has remained unanswered and started, we started asking this questions, uh, question well before uh, February this year. Um, and um, there are no proposals and there have not been, uh, you know, um, compelling proposals that we have heard or compelling discussions on the left forums uh, in which, for example, the security uh, and the local political situation of Eastern Europe would take uh, center stage. So um, how can uh, so how can we on the left guarantee the safety of our people and the people in the in the region? in short and midterm before we um, or at the same time as we work towards this, um, uh, you know, uh, absolutely right global vision and demilitarization, denuclearization, uh, you know, as a, as a kind of an over, overarching set of principles. Um, we are pretty realistic also at Razem that even NATO does not guarantee the safety of our people. Um, this has to do with the transatlantic dimension, uh, which has to be discussed um, uh, by, you know, the member states. So we have been asking ourselves this pretty often. Where would we and Ukraine be if the president of the USA was not Biden or Trump? This is also something that will face us very soon. Um, but uh, in general, we have been struggling uh with this with this view that it's either uh pacifism or militarism and razem wants to challenge this uh in the sense we want to propose an alternative for a um uh left security pol policy that is neither an abstract uh naive pacifism nor militaristic <clears throat> we think that this is uh, a false set of alternatives um and we haven't seen a better example of uh, of this and actually a set of policies that could be taken um, on the national level as far as uh, defense policy is concerned than in the Nordic countries um, recently. So an absolutely correct general long term pacifist stance uh, of the, the left parties in Finland and Sweden uh, was adjusted to the short term political reality and the needs of the people. So the so so the Finnish and Swedish left, of course, begrudgingly, but accepted uh, that the security of the people is the responsibility of the state. And they, uh, um, you know, had to accept the, 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 you know, the most immediate guarantee for the safety. So uh, just to kind of, it's not an excuse for us, it's, it's, it's a reality uh, that in places like Poland, Ukraine and Nordics, uh, the left simply cannot afford to disengage from programmatic defensive analysis in order to maintain uh, opposing NATO imperialism's, uh, imperialism as its sole focus, as it is the case very often. Uh, in uh, on the Western left, uh, particularly um, in countries that uh, either uh, are, you know, post imperialist or still um, um, carry some some imperialist policy forward. That would simply be irresponsible from a state uh, responsibility point of view into our voters. Uh, and we believe that it is possible to oppose NATO imperialism. Uh, and uh, uh, as we have done uh, opposing the Iraq war, the engagement of, uh, of the Polish army in Afghanistan uh, and so on, and to differentiate those local political situations, analyze locally and assess the utility of the Alliance for deterrence purposes in the short and midterm. Uh, so, so, um, but on the general left, as we sit here there, um, and particularly 
on the part of the left and the Western left that does not um, support Ukraine. Um, there is this, this very uh, kind of a um, dogmatic um, type of um, point of view that creates this vacuum of, of ideas uh, regarding security. And it is dangerous because um, it creates a kind of a disengagement um, of, of the left and the discussion on the left, also in other um, very important uh, parts of our policy. Uh, so, for example, with the intersection of military and economic imperialism and the kind of expansion of capital. So, um, so the left disengages with disengages from discussing, for example, with with Razem, uh, whom they uh, the global left might disengage uh, from discussing security policy with Razem, uh, judging us as a kind of a NATO militaristic left. And by doing that, it is opening yet another vacuum of alternatives and support, for example, in the in the in the economic um, um, uh, part. Um, so this is very this is very dangerous, particularly for Ukraine, because this this lack of support and the disengagement of the global left from discussing uh, our security. Um, uh, also kind of facilitates um, uh, economic aggression, so to speak, of the of the capital um, in these other spaces where we do not look for solutions together. So this this vacuum facilitates liberal extremist shock doctrines um, and they can be Im implemented therefore more easily, for example, in the in the Ukraine. So when the, where there is no left and no debate, no internationalist debate, where the left does not participate in the debate uh, and cuts itself effectively out, it allows the capital to take over. And this is what happened in Poland in the early 90s. Uh, we did not have left alternatives uh, for the transformation uh, of the Western left and the radical left. And this is what may also happen in Ukraine uh, if there is no dialogue established soon and this uh, understanding of the different political realities of security uh, connected to it, uh, if if this is not not created somehow, the spaces for the dialogue. So we need massive support in in the shape of specific proposals about how the European and global community uh, can forge a path to a social Ukraine uh, and the safety of the region, because this is of course connected from Russian imperialism, um, and we need uh, urgent and engaged action. So. Uh, so unless there is unequivocal support for the Ukrainian left, for example, and the trade unions that defines this path, uh, unless we remove uh, these vacuums of debate and visions, there will be a shock doctrine shaped neoliberal landscape uh, there. And this applies to a crucial sector, which is the ener energy sector, obviously, as well, that I won't uh, talk about. So what, what do we need in terms of this uh, short-term, mid-term um, defense policy or security policy solution. Um, so, as I said, uh, we want to break with these, this false dichotomy uh, that there is either pacifism or militarism. Uh, so our, that is Razem's policy, wants to break with this and propose a left uh, security policy. So Razem treats the armed forces as a public service institution. Um, and it fulfills the constitutional uh, functions of the state that is the defense of, uh, of the citizens um, and to guarantee that um, the borders uh, are intact. And the armed forces in this context, concept cannot realize its own interests, um, but uh, need to be uh, simply able to defend the citizens and the um, and the borders first and foremost, and only then um, be ready to support um, uh, allies. And uh, the armed forces in our proposal uh, would be um, a kind of a citizen's army with a def defensive, um, defensive character uh with the main uh function and the main kind of role of this uh, of these armed forces would be deterrence 
and of course, this requires from the Polish armed forces in our vision, if this is a public institution, uh, that we demand of this public institution the same standards that we as Razem and the left would like to see uh, in kind of social relations in Poland. Um, that is, for example, uh, we would like to uh, regulate and include um, and uh, guarantee the safety of women and uh, LGBT people uh, serving in the Polish uh, army, which is uh, in terms of women only to a limited extent there. Um, and of course, our defense policy uh, is against uh, a progressive militariz militarization of the society or using uh, the army uh, to kind of uh, in the service of right-wing propaganda. Um, we have quite a lot of um, 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 in, in our history, in the Polish uh, history of the Polish armed forces, we can draw from uh, very many um, uh, traditions that um, show us, you know, the emancipatory and also socialist um, dimension, uh, such as Tadeusz Kościuszko, uh, our participation in the American independence uh, war, uh, the Paris Commune, uh, you know, standing on the side of the Republic in the Spanish Civil War and so on. Um, Another dimension to our our vision uh, of a of a kind of a left program for defense is limiting military budgets uh, to um, two percent uh, at, um, at most um, because you know um, military budgets are not an invitation to kind of a become a lobbyist uh, playground or um, to stimulate growth the way um, uh, for example the U.S. is doing. Um, okay, uh, so this this is kind of an excerpt of what uh, a left defense vision in a specific political uh, situation of Eastern Europe uh, would look like uh, that Razem is proposing. Uh, other uh, proposals that I can talk about later, perhaps in the Q and A, is uh, our ideas for. Um, uh, at least a vision of a European army and complementary um, alliances that we propose as one of our main um, parts of the policy, uh, which is that we would like to see um, military economic alliances um, also in the reg region, for example, in the Baltic region, uh, working towards uh, a European alliance. Um, in a kind of an attempt to, uh, given our specific, uh, skepticism regarding transatlantic relations, um, to kind of work on complementary um, uh, alliances that would go beyond or, you know, even do away uh, with NATO. Um, yeah, and I'll stop here. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Zofia, for uh, a very clear and uh, organized presentation of this tactical vision of the uh, transformation of, uh, of actually building up of uh, a realistic security discourse on the left. And what you said that there is a mm, consensus about the need to talk about secure issues of security on the left and that this is something that is not being discussed is a symptom, in my opinion, of mm, precipitating decline of, of what uh, we know as the American hegemony in, 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 in the last uh, uh, 30 years and uh, stretching back to the, second, to the end of the Second World War. You see that this cracks in hegemony when the issues of domination of crude, uh, crude force uh, domination raises to the surface. While and it is it is visible in the uh, peripheries of of the hegemony in in this 
what Borel called the jungles on, on the uh, edges of the jungle. Mm. And these cracks uh, are much are perceived differently, of course, in the core, where the left is used to fight, uh, is used to fight the world where American neoliberal, uh, global, American led neoliberal globalization is the main, is the main uh, enemy, uh, while we see a new world emerging. And here I would invite Ilya Matveyev to talk about the transformation of this, of this world. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I'm really happy to be here and to be able to present my observations. Uh, so I would begin with a point that uh, the topic of this panel is global security. And uh, obviously, global security is under threat today. Uh, this threat is perhaps uh, unprecedented in uh, recent decades. And the biggest immediate threat is uh, Russia's uh, nuclear threats and uh, uh, the possibility of further escalation of Russia's uh, murderous war in uh, Ukraine. But I think that there is uh, a deeper and structural uh, process going on, because otherwise we could imagine the situation where Russia is defeated militarily, and then there is some kind of political change in Russia, and uh, the world, world security can go back to some kind of normality. But unfortunately, I suspect that uh, this is not possible precisely because of this underlying uh, structural process that is going on uh, in the world. So uh, consider the following facts in uh, uh, Chinese-American relations. First of all, this year, uh, the United States ended its uh, policy of so-called uh, strategic ambiguity towards uh, Taiwan. And uh, American administration basically declared that the United States will intervene in case of war in uh, Taiwan. And this is a huge policy shift for, uh, uh, for America. And then uh, the second thing that happens recently is that uh, the United States declared restrictions on um, exports of latest generation microchips um, to China of uh, equipment uh, for the production of these uh, microchips and uh, a unique policy of forcing uh, American employees in this Chinese microchip industry that they have to choose between uh, their American citizenship or uh, green cards and uh, their continued work in the uh, Chinese microchip industry. So they either continue working there and they lose citizenship or they go back and uh, maintain their citizenship. So uh, this is uh, also rather unprecedented. And this uh, indicates that um, for the United States, it's uh, a decided issue that now the policy is to try and prevent China's uh, technological and economic rise, because this rise itself is threatening uh, American and global security. This is how America sees it. So uh, these are not isolated facts. We also see uh, events like uh, China trying to carry out a stress test, a so-called stress test of um, potential sanctions um, by the West against China that would be similar to uh, sanctions against Russia. And uh, many uh, Chinese companies uh, exit from their American investments because they fear that uh, these investments and these assets could be frozen by the United States uh, government. We also see that foreign investors are uh, exiting uh, China. So there is a, a kind of process of decoupling already going on, economic decoupling. Uh, then we see uh, United States Treasury Secretary uh, Janet Yellen uh, supporting so-called French shoring, meaning uh, locating supply chains within uh, uh, Western geopolitical space and uh, 
uh, severing economic relations with China. So uh, this is uh, a policy that is incre increasingly defended in, uh, uh, in American uh, intellectual circles. So uh, the point is that globalization is basically over and we need to create uh, a kind of trade block uh, that will include uh, politically friendly countries, and we need to sever economic ties to a large extent, sever economic ties to unfriendly countries, and uh, primarily China. So uh, the uh, director of the IMF, Kristalina Georgieva, actually uh, pointed out that this is a possibility. She said that uh, this double crisis, uh, pandemic and war, and our ability to deal with them are further complicated by another growing risk, fragmentation of the world economy into geopolitical blocks. So we see that this is uh, a real objective process that is going on. The formation of this uh, geopolitical and geoeconomic uh, blocks. So uh, in a recent paper, uh, Branka Milanovic wrote that uh, nowadays this is called French shoring. Uh, but in reality, this is trade blocks that we know very well from uh, world's history and uh, trade blocks dominated uh, global trade up until uh, the Second World War. So this is not uh, some kind of new thing. And uh, uh, for Milanovic, uh, this um, string of publications that advocate this severing of economic ties between America and China. So they sort of ignore all this history that the world had with, uh, with the trade blocks in the past. And uh, uh, we can go even further and uh, we can ask uh, the following question. So we know that uh, previously uh, this kind of uh, geopolitical and geoeconomic blocks and inter-imperialist rivalries led to uh, two global worlds. So the First World War and the Second World War. So what would be different this time? So uh, are there any countervailing forces uh, to this uh, growing uh, tension between those uh, emerging uh, political and economic blocks? So can we expect uh, better relations between them? Or we can expect uh, gradually worsening relations uh, between uh, between the West, between uh, China, uh, Russia, that will either try to form its own uh, political economic bloc, or more likely will join China as a subordinate partner, as an ally that is actually uh, a junior partner in this bloc. So uh, potentially, this could result again in this growing, uh, growing. Uh, inter-imperialist rivalries and uh, global tensions that uh, could even result into some kind of global escalation. So this is one thing to think about. There is also a kind of uh, a paradox in this situation because uh, the left previously advocated against uh, free trade, against uh, international institutions such as uh, uh, well, so, such as the WTO, and the idea was that uh, free trade on the global scale is uh, an imperialist policy that is pushed forward by uh, the United States primarily. Uh, and then there is a real alternative to free trade as a policy on the global scale. And it looks like uh, this alternative becomes the mainstream. So this kind of neo-mercantilist approach to trade becomes uh, mainstream. But uh, the question is, is it in, in any way better than the previous free trade policy? So this emergence of political economic blocks and uh, trade and supply chains located within these blocks, severing of economic ties between the blocks and trade wars between the blocks. So is it in any way better? Because uh, previously there could be an argument that economic interdependence limits uh, limits the potential for uh, uh, global conflicts. But if this economic interdependence is uh, gradually eroded, so what prevents this new global conflict from uh, emerging? So this is the big question that I want to ask in this presentation. Uh, and uh, uh, the title of my talk refers to limits 
to this pot potential emergence of uh, uh, political and economic blocks. And I think that there are uh, obviously very serious limits because uh, China and uh, Western countries, of course, uh, still have trillions of dollars in trade. And uh, this will not be possible to quickly uh, limit this trade between these countries. And uh, there is also pushback by uh, some Western leaders. So, for instance, Olaf Scholz recently noted that this idea of uh, uh, limiting supply chains only to geopolitically friendly countries is actually, so he does not support this policy. So, uh, there are limits, obviously, to this process, but uh, my kind of concern is that uh, it can start and then it can uh, have this uh, self-propelling quality. So at first it's, it goes on slowly. Uh, the volume of trade between these blocks is uh, being reduced slowly. And then suddenly there is a kind of uh, 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 this moment when uh, there is a uh, a complete severing of economic ties. And then nothing prevents the world from uh, plunging into uh, a global conflict. So I think uh, this is an important question for uh, the global left to think through uh, not just uh, regional uh, security policy, uh, because I think that uh, Zofia's remarks were extremely interesting and actually useful to me. So they extended my understanding of uh, how we need to think about this on the regional level. But I think this needs to be extended into the global level. And we need to think about kind of global uh, security policy for the left that uh, takes into consideration this idea of new mercantilism, the emergence of new uh, political economic blocks and uh, potential conflict between these blocks. So this is what I wanted to say today. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Ilya. That's a, a great uh, reminder that uh, we need to think uh, not only in uh, medium term and tactical uh, uh, and tactical programs, but also to uh, transform um, our uh, internationalist perspective according to the new and emerging realities. Uh, we need to be ready for this, not least to make the terms of our debates within the left, within the left clearer, uh, if not friendlier, then at least more productive, more productive. Uh, it's, it has been, I have to note this, it's, it has been a pity that in many events, conferences, roundtables that I uh, attended, Mm, we had a conspicuous lack of uh, speakers from, from China, from Vietnam, from Southeast Asia in general, uh, which is uh, frankly, which is frankly surprising. Even if, if it was a more regional, uh, so-called post-socialist or post-Soviet events, uh, we had this uh, very, uh, uh, narrow focus on either just Russia or Ukraine or Eastern Europe, and uh, yeah, we have we have this this glaring lack, which uh, it seems needs an urgent uh, corrective. Mm, I do not think uh, I, I do not see uh, Taras any, anywhere in in Zoom or or on Facebook. Could you please? Uh, 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 Sasha or Oksana, could you please tell me what's whether you have any contact? Uh, he is not available now. And... Okay, okay. So, so it seems that Taras is not available, and I don't think that uh, that we have a reasonable idea whether he will be soon. Mm, so, I would suggest 
moving to the Q and I uh, Q and A uh, session. And in case Taras joins, uh, he will be able to briefly, uh, I think, comment uh, comment on on the the points that are discussed made discussions made. So so far we have yes uh, and. I would like to address the audience again that you can ask questions here in the chat uh, for those who are present in Zoom or in the comment section under the streaming, uh, face, our Facebook streaming. Please do it. I will read your comments and will allow our guests to answer. I think uh, we will. Uh, jump immediately to, to the uh, to the comments that we have already because there are quite quite a few of them and unless they are addressed to uh, to one particular guest uh, one of our guests uh, any any of you can uh, can answer so the first one comes from uh, natalka she says that she is uh, very uh, interested in the points that uh, Gilbert made. I'm sorry, G Gilbert or Gilbert? Uh, as you wish, no problem. Yeah, okay. Uh, that uh, Gilbert uh, made. He say, uh, she says that she would like to add a small note on Gilbert's remarks on Utopia in case this is of interest. He says that uh, she attended the lecture series on Utopia in Columbia Center for Critical Thought, and she says that Utopia can be used as an instrument in transformative politics. If we conceive of it as a procedure that examines the present, in quotation marks, for potential emancipatory practices and breakthroughs in state modes of discourse, Utopia can be a very useful tool for critique of the bad kinds of realism, which can be just another word for uh, conservatism. Yeah, I think the, the point of the, the sort of uh, weird convergence between, that's, that's already my commentary, weird com convergence between the, the purest left uh, and the most conservative views of, of global, uh, of international politics, reflected in fascination that many on the left have with uh, Mearsheimer's, uh, Mearsheimer's realism. So yeah, in this sense, the so-called pure left that, that only sees, uh, uh, only sees uh, the world through the lens of uh, the eventual uh, class struggle that leads to revolution is, is, is in a weird way tactically aligned with, with conservatism. And yeah, maybe if you have, uh, any uh, co any responses to these comments on, on utopia mm, on, or various utopias I would be uh, and its critical uh, potential I would be grateful to, to hear uh, are you expecting me no uh, yeah. I don't think uh, I don't think it was a question it was more uh, 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 just uh, an, uh, a way of telling people about uh, the series of, of lectures organized by Colombia and the rest. Uh, but if you allow me, Volodya, uh, I mean, I think uh, we should be able also to uh, respond to each other, to discuss between each other on the panel. So uh, I would like yes, to- Yes, please, to please. Okay, thank you. Um, two, I mean, two things. One about uh, uh, Elia's uh, Presentation. I think that the idea that uh, free trade and inter, uh, you know, uh, economic interdependence prevent wars is a, a liberal uh, idea, uh, which is wrong, historically, factually wrong. I mean, the First World War came at the, the end or the peak of the first wave of globalization. And there was a major increase in uh, uh, economic interdependence between countries. Uh, the what we call globalization today produced the, the ongoing situation, which is a war situation, a global war situation. So uh, free trade, uh, free trade, uh, 
is just a, a, a recipe for the organization of free war between capitals, capital, various capitals, uh, supposedly without interference of the state. But this is a capitalist utopia because at the end, always the state will side with its own uh, local capital. And we have seen that throughout history. So I think we should be clear, and I'm sure you are, but just to, to, to make that point clearer, that uh, uh, we don't subscribe to this idea that free trade is uh, uh, the path to, to peace. It is not. And actually, we think that uh, countries should be able to put their own development, their social development, especially, their social uh, uh, human de development in the best uh, meaning of the term, uh, at, uh, uh, as the, the, the guiding principle uh, of, uh, of their economic policies. Um, as for uh, Zofia and the, the issue of, of NATO, I think uh, I understand that under the present condition today, in a country like Poland, Razem cannot come and say, we demand the, uh, the withdrawal of, of Poland from, from NATO, right? Uh, that would be extremely unpopular anyway, but uh, that would, I mean, to, to, to explain that would be very, very difficult. However, we have to look at the things uh, historically. Uh, first of all, the left was and, and rightly was, but for the dissolution of NATO at the moment when the Soviet Union collapsed. And that was important to do that at that point. And the United States decided completely otherwise into main, not only maintaining NATO, but changing the nature of NATO, both from the point of view of the function of NATO. And you remark that NATO never engaged in war during the whole uh, time of the Soviet Union or the Cold War. And it's only after the Cold War that NATO started intervening in wars in the Balkans, then uh, Afghanistan, uh, some intervention in Iraq, uh, 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 Libya, uh, et cetera. So there has been a shift in the nature of NATO going along with the expansion of NATO. These are policies that are to a large extent responsible for having created the kind of world in which we are. And saying this is by no means any excuse for Vladimir Putin, but it is, an observation of the fact that Vladimir Putin himself is the result and the product of certain type of policies that uh, were uh, undertaken at the, at the global level. And the second point is that uh, even if you can't, of course, and I understand call for Polish, Polish withdrawal from NATO, you should, and you already do it as you explained, be against the non-defensive uh, 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 um, transformation of NATO, uh, that is like sending Polish troops to Iraq or Afghanistan as happened. You should be against that and you are against that very rightly so. So, uh, so you're not just having a blank, you know, uh, abstract position, of we, we remain in NATO. No, you, you have to explain that. And, and, and therefore uh, uh, the, the issue is, is we are for the dissolution of NATO, in the framework of a global disarmament and the global dissolution of, of, of all. Uh, so that's the kind of goal, middle term, midterm, long-term goal that we are fighting for. Even if we understand that you can't tell the Polish people who feel threatened by Russian imperialism that they should uh, 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 get out of NATO at this point. And if any so-called anti-imperialists, which, which, who are only anti-Western imperialists, as we know, uh, um, object to that, well, would they object to, to, to the, the, the fact that Egypt was uh, uh, armed, completely trained and all that by the Soviet Union when it was fighting uh, Israel, it was threatened by Israel? They, they would not object to that. So they cannot object to Polish armament uh, and Polish uh, desire for uh, protection. Uh, that should be, however, for the preservation of peace and not for any, uh, any, any, uh, any wars. The, the, the key, the major goal remaining that of, of, of uh, disarmament and, and uh, a real uh, uh, observation of, of the international law 
uh, and the UN, UN Charter. Uh, thank you. I, I will give an opportunity to respond uh, to Ilya and Zofia. Uh, please, uh, you may also use this time to uh, reflect on uh, the, what was said previously and to ask uh, your questions to, to the others too. Please, Ilya. Right. So I, I agree with uh, Gilbert completely that free trade is not uh, an ideal in any sense, of course, for the left. And uh, it is not a guarantee for a uh, uh, lack of military conflicts. But uh, what I wanted to point out is this alarming tendency that we see that maybe it's uh, the destiny of kind of free trade regimes to ultimately result in this division of the world. And at this point, we see already this second kind of division of the world, this new imperialist division of the world. And, and, and this looks uh, quite scary because we know from history what happens after the world is divided into these blocks. But of course, yeah, like, I, I don't agree with this liberal line that if only everyone traded with everyone, then we, we will never have wars. So it's true because we still have them. And this is uh, what we see at the moment. Yeah. Uh, Zofia? Uh, thank you, Gilbert, for the remarks. Uh, I would disagree. Uh, the way I understand, uh, I would disagree with one point. I agree with all of the things you said, and I will come on to uh, Razem's policy on kind of you know NATO aggression and imperialistic impulses after uh, after the Cold War. But uh, I'm not sure I understand this uh, this claim that somehow NATO's expansion, particularly uh, in Eastern Europe uh, or the you know the the, the current NATO flank, um, somehow created the conditions. I, I think, or or I agree only. No, I actually would say that it's rather um, the the uh, escapades, uh, half imperialistic and definitely um, not agreeing with international law uh, that uh, that NATO uh, has done has given like a blank check to to put into to do what he's doing right now. That's definitely so, but I do not understand yet the connection how. NATO expansion emboldened uh, uh, NATO to 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 you know uh, do these breaches. Um, exactly. Um, particularly that you know the behavior of the alliance on the eastern flank after um, Poland and other countries joined has been extremely careful vis-a-vis -vis Ru Russia. Right. This uh, again is a testament to, in, in the sense, I hope agrees with this call that you know we should not judge everything uh, and block uh, and have a look at the political reality. So you know, um, uh, so the the kind of the will of escalation in on the eastern eastern European flank of NATO has always actually been uh, on Russia's part, um, and it's it's kind of Russia that came up closer to to our borders than the other way around. So uh, this kind of encirclement uh, idea is 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 actually a smokescreen, I think. And you know every single step of accession of a Central European country into the pact was followed by very careful measures, you know, regarding military presence that, uh, not in order not to provoke Russia. So, for example, before 2014, there were no American troops on uh, on Polish soil, and definitely there are no nuclear weapons, and probably there won't be uh, uh, any there. Um, and so on. So, but we, I, I'm sure we can we can discuss the, <laughs> the NATO expansion as, aspect for a, for a very long time. Uh, what I wanted to say is uh, is uh, as a, as a second part of my response response is that uh, you know we are at Razem worried very much about uh, you know this um, Pacific pivot of the United States uh, and these ir irresponsible behavior of some of, uh, uh, you know, Donald Trump uh, and perhaps, you know, the future uh, Republican president, I don't know, Marco Rubio or whoever is gonna be. So this uh, this guarantee, this convenient, uh, even though not comfortable um, guarantee of the stability of NATO and the, you know, the security in the region is, 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 is kind of right now, not warranted and troubling 
uh, we have uh, had an absolutely unequivocal negative judgment of the Polish participation in the American occupation of Afghanistan and Iraq, um, and particularly those arguments that were done, uh, made in favor uh, of, of, of this participation uh, that were made by the Polish governments and Polish uh, politicians that this is going to result in some uh, contracts uh, to rebuild uh, and to extract uh, fossil fuels. Uh, the, the, these are things that are absolutely, you know, go counter to every value that that Razem has. And we are against any imperialistic war uh, under the Polish banner or, you know, so as a as a rule, we think that uh, that the armed forces that we propose uh, should only take part in in kind of peace missions, uh, UN peace missions and humanitarian mis missions, and they should be uh, all sorts of engagement. Even if you have a UN NATO a UN mandate, is not enough because there should be any any kind of uh, extraterrestrial uh, use of the Polish forces should be confirmed by the parliament. And this links to uh, uh, to what uh, Catherine Summary was saying, um, that we should have more democratic uh, control over what over armed forces in general, so that we do not have situations such as, you know, the the, the president of Poland, uh, Andrzej Duda, single-handedly sends F-16s uh, uh, to Syria. This is absolutely uh, unacceptable. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you. I think Gilberto, you can very briefly respond to to the question about NATO, uh, the relation between NATO expansion and uh, its more aggressive behavior. Yeah, well, uh, thank you, uh, thank you, Zofia. But I, I understand where you're coming from. I can easily put myself in your shoes and understand how someone in Poland may see that. Uh, but allow someone from the Middle East, as I am, to look at things differently and look at things at the global level and see how Russia can feel towards the United States. Russia, uh, after the, the, the fall of the Soviet Union, and at the time when, when the United States was claiming that it would you know, be building a new world order, respecting international law, defending the weak against the strong and all that. All this proved, excuse me for the term, but total bullshit, right? Uh, the, uh, th that started with the, the, the wars in the, the Balkans, the Kosovo War, which, which is something that could have been avoided, first war of NATO, right? And for Russia, that was very, I mean, that was uh, seen as, as something very aggressive and a real breach in the promises of a, of a different world. Then you had... Uh, not long after that, three, four years after that, the invasion of Iraq by completely circumventing the, uh, the, the, the United Nations Security Council and the rest. And you have these rounds of expansion. You have George W. Bush scrapping the anti-ballistic uh, anti missile treaty. So you have a lot, a lot of gestures by the United States in which the expansion of NATO was full part which meant the extension of the US empire regarding Russia as a potential rival. And this is definitely something that fostered, that stoked in Russia nationalism, uh, nationalism that was exploited by Putin. Putin came as a result of that, as a result of the, of, of, uh, the weakness of Yeltsin uh, in, in the front of the United, uh, United States, the, 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 this impotence of, of, of Yeltsin facing the United States, that led to Vladimir Putin and the catastrophe that we have been seeing. And even when Putin came, he, he even at some point tried to join NATO and he understood and they told him it's not for Russia. I mean, uh, clearly. So how do you want Russia to interpret all that? And then he gets into his Vladimir Putin thuggish, completely thuggish methods. So to block Georgia from joining, I invade part of, of Georgia. Abkhazia and I don't know what, uh, to uh, uh, block Ukraine from joining, I, 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 I annexate uh, uh, Crimea and uh, entered in, in uh, Eastern Ukraine. These are thuggish gangster methods, no doubt, but we have to understand also that on the other end, there is a gangster, a big gangster, much bigger actually, hmm? much more powerful, and that is the United States and, and, and Western European countries and now Eastern European countries 
are acting as vessels of the United States. So that's oh, yeah, part, yeah. I, I agree with yeah, you. Can I okay, so so do I do, the, yeah, do I understand you? Do I understand you correctly that the participation of Eastern European countries that joined the alliance, the participation in these illegal uh, uh, invasions, for example, Iraq and Afghanistan, created this, this situation where Putin was, in that sense, that Eastern European expansion of NATO has, has, has created Putin the, the way we have it now. If you, uh, if you mean that, I absolutely agree. These were major mistakes. By, by the Polish government to kind of get enthusiastic, to feel like now we are part of a bigger, you know, it's an imperialist impulse. This is an imperialist impulse that has to be by us, Razem. Really, we are, we are probably the only political power on the left in, in Poland, which, which is simply disgusted by this kind of vassal-like attitude um, of, of, of many Polish governments, be it on the nominal left, on the right, or the right, you know, kind of uh, paying tribute every time there is a there is an American politician coming. This is this is this is not good, and it leads to such situations and is endangering our our uh, security and and everybody else, as, as you as you rightly stated. So this is this is not acceptable, and in in that sense, I agree your point, and I I agree with your point. Yes. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, very interesting exchange. I would, uh, before uh, honoring our audience, uh, getting back to their questions, I would actually address Ilya uh, on this point because uh, it seemed to me uh, that this, this, that of course, whereas we um, uh, object to, 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 to NATO expansion as the immediate cause of, of the war of, of Russia's invasion, but in the in, in long term perspective as a structural cause, it is quite valid. And now we can see that uh, Russia, uh, that, that how Russia frames its own actions, uh, how even the uh, this Russian speakers uh, modulate their messages. Uh, a, a lot of it, a lot of it, it's, it's some sort of mimetic mimesis uh, of, of NATO and. Uh, and U.S. behavior in a way. Could you maybe comment on this a bit? Because you 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 wrote a, a lot about Russian behavior. Well, I can just agree that uh, uh, it's it's never been in the nature of Putin's regime to provide any kind of alternative to NATO, for instance, or any kind of security alternative uh, to the world, because. Uh, it has been some kind of one-sided criticism, but then this constant desire to reproduce what, what the West is doing. And in fact, this desire is something like pathological that they, on the one hand, uh, criticize the West all the time. On the other hand, there is really uh, this wish to show everyone that Russia is capable of doing the same. So it's true that uh, uh, in many ways, uh, Putin is uh, mirroring uh, NATO in particular, so we know that, uh, for instance, uh, this this thing pointed by Ivan Krastev that uh, Putin's speech uh, after the annexation of Crimea had uh, parts of uh, Kosovo Declaration of Independence just reproduced, you know, so, so this is the kind of uh, perverse uh, kind of logic that Putin has, it's true, and uh, this is it, it, and he is actually so open about this, about uh, the fact that he has no desire to produce any kind of alternative. He just wants to do exactly the same thing, but in his own uh, backyard, let's say, right? And so this is one of the things that uh, um, makes it very strange that the left anywhere still thinks that uh, you know Russia can play any kind of progressive role because it is fighting NATO, but it's just a kind of another imperialist power fighting fighting NATO. And, and Putin is perfectly open himself about that. And then as some tanky leftists say, it's dialectics. that say, you know, yes, they are two imperialists, but this is dialectics. But obviously this is not how dialectics works, but, uh, but yes, I agree with your original point, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I think we have a we have a duty to our audience uh, to also uh, react to their questions. So we have uh, we have a question from Rachel Atwood, and it concerns. Uh, so she asks, will Sweden's new right leaning administration change its approach to NATO and support for Ukraine, 
in any major ways from the previous government, if anyone knows. And moreover, will they scale back on accepting refugees from Ukraine and other conflict zones? Uh, does anyone want to respond? You are mute, uh, Gilbert. You are mute. I'm just saying that none of us can speak about Sweden and Finland, I presume. I mean, unless someone has a, a special knowledge about it, but none of us uh, is, to my knowledge. Oh, okay. Uh, if if nobody wants, then we'll... Uh... Okay. Uh, someone responded, actually, in the chat. Yeah, please pay attention to the chat. There is some kind of parallel discussion, which I won't read all of it. And uh, please, uh, those who are on Facebook, leave your question questions in the comments. Mm. We have rather a comment uh, uh, from Catherine Summary, uh, I guess, uh, to Zofia. You, you, you can, you can. I think you can just read it because it's uh, it's it's a long comment. Then we have a question from Lev, uh, Lev Turesenko. He asks, can limiting the sovereignty of nation states, states help by transferring part of it to international intergovernmental organizations to ensure global peace and international security? And uh, yeah, that's it. I think, yeah, Gilbert. Uh, Excuse me? You... That was a question to Gilbert, and that's a broad question of whether nation, uh, transfer, uh, limiting the sovereignty of nation states can help by transferring part of it, the sovereignty to international inter, uh, intergovernmental organizations. Um, I, no, I mean, I, I don't think that uh, 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 the, the, this can be done because, again, this uh, uh, cannot work in the real world except as very unevenly to the advantage of the major powers and disadvantage of the small countries and, and weaker countries. Uh, that's why I said the principle of non-interference in the internal affairs of states by other states. Uh, again, I, I drew a very clear distinction between states and social movements, political parties, and all that. That's different. But as, as states, I think uh, it's important. Now, nevertheless, the UN itself put some limitation to that with the responsibility to protect uh, uh, resolution. Uh, responsibility to protect uh, uh, is like the rest of the interventions provided for by the UN Charter. It depends on a decision of the U uh, Security Council. In the Security Council, of course, for action, you need uh, unanimity uh, or at least non-objection from the five permanent members, right? Because they have veto rights. So if they vote against, it cannot work. If they abstain or vote for, it can work. So it depends. So this issue of the veto right is a legacy of the Second World War. It's based on, on relations of power. Is that, it's an expression of the kind of relation of powers you had. And it's it also translates in the fact that these are the major, the five countries are the major uh, nuclear powers anyway. Uh, so whatever limitations there are to this, uh, uh, that, that's how uh, it exists. Now, so that means that at least there is some opening for intervention in the case of, of, uh, of crimes against humanity. But as we know, as it works today, unfortunately, the, there is uh, very little room for uh, consensus among the uh, uh, five permanent members. Uh, of the uh, UN Security Council. So what remains here, it, what, what remains is that uh, in case of wars, first of all, I think uh, when a country breaches international law like Russia did in invading Ukraine, uh, it is perfectly uh, uh, legitimate for other countries to send weapons to Ukraine. 
that is a support for uh, Ukraine's right to self-defense. And that's why as a, a, a socialist, uh, we should not uh, uh, oppose uh, the arming of Ukraine. On the contrary, I, I'm not saying that we should uh, argue for more arming, no, but at the very least, we, we cannot oppose that. I mean, this is legitimate and should be done. Otherwise, Ukraine would have been uh, completely just subjugated by, uh, by Russian uh, uh, imperialism. Uh, uh, this, in the same way, if, if, if you have a civil war in a country with a, with a government uh, using, uh, you know, uh, committing major crimes, against humanity, I think it's perfectly also legitimate to uh, demand the arming of the those uh, who are uh, fighting oppression, right? Uh, so who objected to the arming of the Kurdish by the United States, uh, the Kurdish movement uh, in, in against uh, ISIS, against the Islamic State and, uh, and other uh, such uh, oppressors? Uh, not so. Th th these are situations where, uh, uh, I mean, you can transgress an abstract vision of sovereignty when a state is divided, when you have a, a situation of war, and the rest. So these are the parameters I think within which uh, uh, we can uh, uh, work, and these are the parameters I think that should guide a socialist policy on international relations. Uh, thank you. Now we have uh, two rather broad questions. Uh, mm, okay, that comes from our Facebook. Uh, how can we as the left react to increasingly more dangerous and what and world and push for demilitarization in this situation? Uh, keeping in mind research and production period of modern weapons time needed to produce them, et cetera. And what, the way, uh, what, what is the way uh, in, in the short and term and medium term to ensure international security while pursuing the militarization in our countries? Because realistically, bilateral demilitarization of authoritarian and democratic countries is impossible now without U.S. astonishing research and development for weapons and, and their land lease act, what in Ukraine could go in absolutely uh, other directions as European weapon supplies absolutely is not enough. How to answer to this increasingly dangerous conflict? So I, I think that that's the dilemma of demilitarization in, in, the, in the conditions of war. I think Zofia, Zofia uh, alluded to that. You, you asked Zofia to speak, no? Yeah, I, I think I would invite her because she alluded to, to that, to yeah. these two demands of yeah, the military. Is, yeah, Zofia, is I, I alluded to. The simultaneous claim uh, simultaneous need for uh, demilitarization and uh, reinforcement of military uh, military uh, component of security. Um, well, what I was what I was calling for is first of all not to uh go into the, this kind of dogmatic uh rejection of the discussion of security frameworks and how sometimes we need to militarize uh in the short or midterm responding to uh, exactly imperialist aggression or you know participating in a uh as a, as a side in a, in a in a just war uh or even fulfilling this public uh service kind of uh mandate of uh humanitarian or um uh peace missions uh you, you know i i just I, I what i meant i guess is that um um we cannot kind of 
uh, dismiss uh, the political situation on the ground with a blank statement that uh, you know there should be no weapons and uh, we should demilitarize ourselves. Uh, so, so yes, uh, I am for um, uh, simultaneous kind of paying attention, like like for example, this proposal uh, to limit military budgets, paying paying attention attention to uh, to this overarching. Uh, principle that uh, we shouldn't uh, first of all give uh, a, a window of opportunity for uh, uh, you know uh, the military industrial complex lobbying with a washing uh, you know the, the the weapons market with 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 cash uh, this is this is one thing we should we should we should have in our, in our sites. And of course, do not uh, allow for for a militarization of of the society by somehow giving uh, also uh, uh, too too much kind of independence to uh, to to the military elites or you know the structures. This should all be uh, under democratic control as much as much as possible. Um, but my 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 general call was we need to start talking about. Uh, uh, how to do that, having uh, on the left and also on the, on the radical left, and uh, keep in mind these uh, different scales at which we operate, um, <clears throat> and uh, and not try to ignore one of those, because as as the as the story of Eastern Europe and the Nordics and so on uh, uh, shows, uh, it's just simply not possible. Thank you. Thank you. The next question from the same author, I think, it's addressed to Gilbert. Uh, he uh, that's a uh, lot. He asks, uh, uh, what what would have been an alternative to NATO after the collapse of the USSR? Uh, since you alluded to the uh, to that the NATO should have been uh, dismantled, uh, because we know that Russia attacked uh, each carrier in '94 and used military to de uh, to destroy its. Uh, Opposition in '93, uh, which is of course uh, raises legitimate questions about the security of bordering countries. So, in other words, the the question is like this: uh, If you say that NATO should have been disbanded in in '91, uh, how should the world have been? Uh, uh, I don't know, the defending itself and against uh, Russia's aggressive acts uh, in the 90s. That, I think, was the, was the point. Well, um, uh, first, let me comment on the previous question. Uh, all the U.S. aid to Ukraine is a very tiny fraction of U.S. military expenditure. So the belief that uh, the United States needs to increase its military expenditure in order to help Ukraine is, is not uh, very serious, I would say. The United States far outspends the rest of the world, not only Russia, the whole rest of the world uh, militarily. And, uh, and the result of that, uh, don't look at things through the angle of Ukraine alone, okay? You have other countries on the planet. Iraq has been destroyed to a far larger extent than Ukraine has been, right? By US imperialism in 1991, precisely. And this question about the 90s and Russia, whatever Russia has done in the 90s is very small compared to the destruction of Iraq in 91 by the United States, uh, followed a few years later by the invasion and occupation of Iraq. And in, in between, between 91 and 2003, Iraq, after having been destroyed in a way that uh, today Russian bombing of Ukraine starts resembling, the, the United States destroyed the whole infrastructure of Iraq in 91. It, that's what Russia is trying to do in Ukraine today. And then the United States imposed an embargo on Iraq from 91 to 2003. According to the UN uh, uh, agencies and UNICEF, this led to the death, the difference in mortality of 90,000 people per year, including 50,000 or 55,000 children, 50,000 children under the age of five, which were victims of this embargo uh, combined with the destruction of infrastructure. So over 12 years, 90,000 people dying every year out of that, that is more than a million being killed 
by the action of US imperialism. So please get back to reality and look at the world as it is, not only through the angle of, uh, of, uh, of Eastern Europe. You have, you have to take a, a global perspective. That's why we are socialists and we are internationalists. That's what socialism means. And that means that's why we are against all imperialisms. And we can't belittle the fact that the United States is, is the largest and the most thuggish imperialism uh, in the world. Uh, of course, uh, as I said this, uh, repeatedly, uh, Putin is, is, a, is a total murderer, he's a criminal, he's a thug, everything you want. But uh, uh, he is, as, uh, 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 as uh, uh, Ilya pointed, when he does that, he says, well, I'm doing like you. All his speeches are exactly put making that argument. What I'm doing is exactly what the United States have been doing. He just quotes the United States. He says, look what you are doing. So don't give me lessons. Don't teach me lessons. You, uh, look at yourselves. I'm doing what you are doing. So uh, this is not to excuse Putin. That's absolutely zero excuse to Putin. Uh, in the same way that uh, if, if the United States uh, uh, said the same, we, we would say, so we have to remain as socialist internationalists anti-imperialist against all imperialism, uh, Western be they, or, 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 or Russian, or, 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 or if China uh, gets into invasive war, we would have to, the, we should have the, the same, uh, uh, the same, the same uh, uh, attitude. So that's the, 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 the meaning here. And, uh, and uh, uh, so uh, when, when the, 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 so the uh, Warsaw Pact and the Soviet Union were, were dissolved, you had a request, you had an alternative to NATO, which was the Organization for the Security uh, and Cooperation in Europe, the OSCE. And the, the Russian side was uh, asking for, a, 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 how to say, an upgrade of the role of the OSCE, which is pan-European, all European countries, East and West. Huh? The, the former Soviet Union republics to to uh, to Spain and uh, to 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 the uh, the Atlantic shore, uh, and this should have been the major security organization in Europe, uh, uh, and alongside the United Nations for the global uh, global uh, policies. So these policies should have been pursued vigorously by the left, but the the, the, the left didn't have a real program and a real conception of, of international relations. Here and there you had such position, but they were not really put forward. So there were alternatives. Another world was possible and another world is possible today. And we have to be very clear about that. That's our role as socialists. Not to say, oh, that's the only choice or the only game in town. No, we have to fight for something else. And when we speak of disarmament, this is coordinated disarmament, not unilateral disarmament. Uh, uh, when Engels wrote his pamphlet, Friedrich Engels, Marx's uh, companion, he, he, he was not advocating that in each country you have to fight for unilateral disarmament. That's not what he was saying. He was saying the workers' movement should put forward a program for the global work, for the international workers' movement to fight for the simultaneous disarmament of all countries. That's what the Nobel uh, uh, Peace Prize winners uh, have been uh, advocating a coordinated reduction of all military budgets. You know, the major threat facing humanity today is climate change. Uh -huh. And the, the amounts that are spent on weapons and on the military are far superior to anything that the states are putting to fight against climate change, which is a much bigger threat than anything else. Uh, the, 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 that, that's the, the, the key point we have to... Uh, uh, to keep in mind, not to mention the fact that the military is a major polluter. Uh, uh, the military itself is a major polluter, even without war. And of course, when you add war, look at Ukraine. Uh, the environmental damage caused by Russia in Ukraine by this war is uh, certainly more than several decades of industrial uh, uh, pollution. It is terrible. And we have also to keep that in mind very much as socialists. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, I think G Gilbert wrote an article about Engels as a military thinker, as a strategist. And I would very much advise everyone to 
to, to check it because I think it's one of the topical kind of uh, elements of, of, of the Marxist thinking that we keep, keep forgetting. Uh, we have uh, many, many questions and we have uh, little time. So let's, let's move on. We have a question to Zofia. Uh, would the for, uh, from Artem, would the format of international conferences similar to that of Rammstein, where different nations gather to discuss needed support and to provide such support to the countries under the threat, already fighting the imperialist threat, be a fair and righteous replacement to NATO? Would uh, Rammstein be a replacement to NATO? Uh, I would widen the, 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 this question to the, to the other panelists. Uh, I think, of course, it is uh, a positive uh, phenomenon and it's within NATO, I guess, that this is, uh, this is happening. Uh, that uh, in this context of, you know, supporting uh, Ukraine, in uh you know defending itself against the uh imperialist uh aggression with kind of you know neo fascist and uh genocidal uh, traits uh and so i'm i'm not sure whether this format this rammstein format is being right now kind of presenting itself uh as an alternative because um it is engaged in uh you know supporting uh an anti-imperialist uh, effort and it just looks like that or whether it would be a good general principle uh apart from the general idea that it's good for nations to uh you know try and try and work on the solution together and so on um uh, on the other hand, you know, those nations that discuss in Rammstein are, uh, apart from the Ukrainian side, um, you know, Western affluent uh, uh, um, nations that basically have uh, very large expenditures and industries, weapon industries. Um, so I, I'm not sure if this is the, 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 the good example uh, to replace. NATO, but I would like to ask my co-panelists that as well. What would be a yes, fair and righteous replacement? Excuse me. Uh, I would invite you to respond to Zofia's uh, question. Maybe Elia first, because I've sp spoken a lot. Yes, Elia. Sorry, I, I didn't hear the question. I only heard uh, so, so Zofia uh, finished her uh, uh, answer by by addressing it essentially to to both of you. What would be the fair alternative to NATO? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I think Zofia said in the beginning of her, her presentation that uh, there's a need for for these kinds of proposals, but I don't think that we can immediately fulfill <laughs> these needs. You know, <laughs> what is the um, alternative to NATO? But I would say that, for instance, can this kind of meeting of countries to supply one country with uh, weapons, you know, can it replace NATO? I mean, realistically, no. Because NATO is not just a formal alliance, it's also a system of uh, weapons, of standards, of uh, uh, all kinds of military uh, military standards that, that is needed to uh, increase uh, military capacity of each country. So it's not just that the countries meet you know, at a NATO summit and that's it. It's also a huge amount of uh, hidden work. So I don't think that we can really replace NATO with, if we seriously talk about NATO as a, a defensive alliance that can help uh, in situations like, like the Russian one, then unfortunately, these kinds of meetings probably won't allow to replace NATO. But I think that uh, um, like ultimately there could be something else, maybe some, some, some new alliance that would be uh, that would, for instance, uh, in its charter, uh, be even more clear on, uh, uh, you know, excluding wars of aggression and uh, so-called wars of choice, so that uh, uh, situations like uh, Serbia and uh, Afghanistan cannot be repeated, something like this. 
But uh, NATO is, I mean, this is the difficulty of talking about security policy from a leftist perspective, because then we need to go into all those, uh, let's say, dirty details that the left kind of refuses to even engage with. The, the combat effectiveness of troops, for instance, because if we if we think about uh, uh, the the capacity to defend itself for the countries, for to, the capacity to defend themselves, then we need to think about uh, the efficiency of of the army, right? And and NATO improves the efficiency, so it's not just about the alliance, it's not just about uh, the fifth article of the NATO Charter that. Uh, uh, that means that uh, United States will intervene. It's also about uh, this constant work of uh, uh, bringing the armies to the NATO standards, right? So, um, and then this becomes a kind of slippery slope because uh, uh, if we agree to all these points in NATO, then what is exactly the leftist policy here? So. Uh, just to to accept the existence of NATO as a leftist force, or to have some kind of limitation on NATO, to have some kind of internal reform of NATO, and so on. So, uh, in that sense, it's actually a very difficult question. And I think that Zofi already had uh, a lot of um, valid points, a lot of work done on this. But I think that even more work needs to be done to to think about this because uh, it is quite dangerous when we start about, with you know you start from accepting NATO tactically, which is perfectly understandable, and then you end up uh, just uh, agreeing to to all those uh, you know internal structures of NATO that exist, and so what, then what is left of uh, internationalism, for instance, and uh, um, so yeah, there's there's really a lot to think about. Uh, thank you. We have uh, really a lot of interventions and questions, uh, but unfortunately, we have only three minutes left. Uh, I would just say that uh, we have uh, we received greetings from uh, uh, Jin Young Kim from uh, the leftist organization of in South Korea PSSP, who uh, says that they support the Ukrainian left. Uh, we have. Uh, some comments that you can read in, in, in the chat that are not exactly questions. Uh, and we have a large question about uh, the role of the UN and it's the possibility of its uh, continue, continue, continuing relevance, which I think we can't really finish today. Uh, so, yes, Gilbert? Yeah, uh, a quick comment to add to uh, the end. Two things. Uh, first, uh, NATO is basically an alliance of one overlord, a suzerain, and vassals. The overlord is the United States of America. The vassals are the European countries. That's what NATO is. And uh, one can uh, think, for instance, of uh, uh, defense, uh, whatever it is, research, uh, coordination at the European level, not depending on the United States, because the United States is now pushing Europe in a very dangerous direction, which is turning NATO. That's a, a new step in the transformation of NATO into including China, not only Russia, but China as a target of NATO. The last uh, NATO summit for the first time uh, uh, pointed to, to China as, 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 the, as uh, in some way the opponent or the enemy. This is extremely dangerous. And the United States, uh, Ilya spoke of that, the United States uh, has been taking an aggressive stance uh, towards China, just stoking fire in the relation on, in, on the issue of Taiwan, which leads China uh, in its turn to react aggressively. And that's uh, also something to be condemned. But this is a very dangerous thing. So that's why there is an alternative to NATO. There should be an alternative to NATO. And uh, that should start by uh, refusing uh, U.S. suzerainty over Europe, which which led to yeah, just take the occupation of Iraq for instance. Uh, that was uh, uh, some key European countries opposed that, but uh, they could not uh, do uh, anything. France and Germany were against this, and yet the United States uh, could uh, was able to draw other countries into this terrible 
uh, uh, tragedy that the occupation of Iraq was. So thank this you, is thank I you, Gilbert. And, uh, uh, Gilbert. Unfortunately, we have to finish no, here. Have I have to say, yeah, I, I have to express my gratitude to. Gratitude to our audience who was uh, very engaged and active. And I personally have to say that all of the issues, uh, all of the uh, problems raised here are definitely central to, uh, to, the, to, to elaborating our internationalist point of view. And we'll keep it in mind in our future discussions and the materials that we will commission and write for commons. Uh, so again, thank you very much and I wish you a peaceful evening and uh, yeah, uh, good luck to everyone.